but I just felt so sorry for the creature at the end. Sorry for the creature? Why'd you want him to marry the girl? He was kind of scary looking, but he wasn't really all bad. I think he just craved a little affection, you know, a sense of being loved and needed and wanted. That's a very interesting point of view. <laughs> oh, do you feel the breeze from the subway? Isn't it delicious? Sort of cools the ankles, doesn't it? Throughout the history of cinema, the role of the actress has become more prominent over the generations, where we have been introduced to big names such as Marilyn Monroe, Megan Fox, Scarlett Johansson, and many more. However, within film, a large majority of productions feature the actress in a manner that can only be described as sexualized. With this, the male gaze theory was created in order to show that this sexualization is still prominent in film and is continuing to this day. So what is the male gaze theory? Created by Laura Mulvey in 1973 through her seminal paper, visual pleasure and narrative cinema delves into how the female image is depicted in the visual and the literary from a male heterosexual viewpoint. In short, how women are portrayed as a sexual object. Within this thesis, Laura Mulvey discusses the effect of this portrayal in film. One quote being, the cinema satisfies a primordial wish for pleasurable looking, where curiosity and the wish to look intermingle with a fascination with lightness and recognition. I was irritated. And instead of being an absorbed spectator, a voyeuristic spectator, a male spectator, as it were, I suddenly found I'd become a woman spectator who watched the film f from a distance and critically rather than with those um, absorbed eyes. There are multiple areas in which the theory touches on how a woman is presented in film. The human face, the human body, the relationship between the human form and its surroundings, the visual presence of the person in the world, various elements that grant the male heterosexual audience their sexual fantasies from viewing the film. Let's take a look back to 1950. Marilyn Monroe in almost all of her productions was presented as a woman to be looked upon. She would always be seen as one of the biggest sex symbols of that era, where she would be portrayed as sultry, alluring and eye-catching in almost all of her films. She starred in many films, one of which being The Seven Year Itch and another called Bus Stop. In both of these films she can be seen looked at by her male peers and made out to be a selling point for the films. And these are only two examples compared to the rest of the film she has been in. One actress, Doris Day, well known for films such as Calamity Jane, would never show more skin than necessary. She refused to ever over-sexualise herself in film or appease this sexual fantasy due to keeping her image clean. Doris herself stated that she wanted nothing to do with films that had naked bodies thrashing about. One role in particular that she refused to do was the graduate's Mrs. Robinson. Mrs. Robinson, you're trying to seduce me. <laughs> in her autobiography, Pardon? she stated, I was offered the part of Mrs. Robinson in The Graduate, but I could not see myself rolling around in the sheets with a young man half my age whom I'd seduced. I realised it was an effective part, but it offended my sense of values. The sexualisation in film is also prominent in how it films said actresses in the scene, how they appear, the clothes they wear, and the use of filmmaking devices that enhance this visualisation. Laura Mulvey has argued in a thesis about the way that women are displayed on the screen, saying that the film opens with the woman as an object of the combined gaze of spectator and all the male protagonists in the film. This kind of technique can be spotted in many films and is incorporated in a fashion that is blatant to the viewer. 
One example film, Die Another Day by director Lee Tamahori, includes a scene of actress Hale Berry emerging from the ocean. Take note on how this scene is presented, a slow motion shot that lingers on her physique, a central focus on the actress, and an onlooking protagonist who visually explores her. Let's skip over to another film by the same franchise, Casino Royale, by director Martin Campbell. A similar setting occurs where our lead protagonist exits the ocean. Now it can be argued that this counteracts the male gaze, for it presents Daniel Craig in a similar manner as before, however the scene itself is shot differently. There is no slow motion shot to linger on Daniel's body. The scene doesn't last as long as before, and then the camera focuses on a woman that Daniel is looking at, directing all attention to her. Speaking of characters looking at the actress, in various films the male protagonist or side character can be seen ogling the female lead, done in a manner that is obvious for the audience, for the female lead is presented as something to be looked at. What? A few examples that are fairly obvious are pieces such as Michael Bay's Transformers or Robert Zemeckis's Who Framed Roger Rabbit. In both of these pieces, the lead male protagonist is blatantly portrayed as looking at the female lead for their sexuality. The camera lingers on the female form for long periods of time and makes no effort to hide the revealing intentions as a means to sate the male audience. Now that we are in the 2000s, we are now being introduced to films that incorporate the female lead with attributes that counteract the male gaze theory. Films such as The Hunger Games by Gary Ross and Fargo by Joel Cohen, which show the female leads as strong, independent and don't act feminine in terms of their personality or their attire. They are also not subject to sexualisation. Director Noah Hawley strays away from the male gaze with his films, saying, The reality is, it has the insidious power of being considered normal in that the history of cinema is primarily male. How the trope of sexualisation is overlooked by many due to how often it appears. Despite the appearance of the aforementioned films that have a more positive light on the female actress, there are still more films that have been made and still being made that follow the male gaze. When so few films, as mentioned, are presented against the examples I've shown, it shows that there is still a demand for this sort of portrayal in film.